progress. <laughs> All right, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order for the Committee of the Whole today. Um, obviously, as you can all see, I'm here virtually today uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, um, but plan to join you all later for the council meeting. Um, so to facilitate a better discussion, I was going to turn things over to council member Prince today to uh, chair the meeting, but I'll get us started because I know right where we left off and that was um, questions for the executive department. But I will I will uh, hand it over since I can't actually see the desks uh, to Councilmember <laughs> Prince. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, any council members have questions for the executive department? You might be getting off easy. I know. Let's. Go. I'll take it. You can find me anywhere, anytime. If you do have questions after this. Mr. Chair. Yes. Go ahead. For what is worth, I did have a question. I need to find it. I will follow up with you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I had something. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, um, Councilmember Prince. Um, I do just have a quick question. Could you expand um, a little bit on the 212,000 um, addition for the community engagement budget for the one full time employee and additional funds on contracted services to expand the capacity of the division? Yes, so that will be one full time employee position focused primarily on updating the website and essentially a webmaster. We're also increasing a part time employee to full time to expand the capacity of our print shop and then consulting professional services to expand where we don't have expertise. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the executive department? Mr. Prasir? Yes. Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I do have a question about the website update. Uh, when we redid the whole thing, which was four years ago, we had like presentation after presentation letting us know that this company was new and was not going to get updated. And four years now, after all the money that we invested, again, is updated. How are we going to solve that problem that it doesn't keep happening, that we keep on with the website that should and should work the way you know i don't know I don't. well i can't promise that technology won't out outrun us um but we will be working closely with it to make sure that we're looking at the most advanced technology that's out there as well as uh bringing in other uh new more innovative solutions that we may have not looked at last time but i can't promise it won't get outdated soon but we will have a really active um, collaboration between communications and IT to make sure that it's successful and sustainable. So also maintaining it so that it sticks with our framework and we plan, we're very thoughtful about how we lay it out and how we, what information we put on it. May I have a following question? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I do remember in the many, many conversations that we have and many, many presentations and it was substantial amount of uh, an investment. Uh, the one of the, the the questions that keep coming is, you know, the old website that we used to have. You link and you always they always appear uh, pages that were obsolete. Obsolete. Today, this now is happening with the new website. Yes. You, we, I don't know what is the process, not just to update a software, but keep removing the things that are not working anymore and keep maintaining that website uh, that is always updated and, and relevant. Because an upside, uh, having a website out there that is not updated or not maintained constantly is useless. And, and, it, and it's the, the window of the city out there to the world. So... I couldn't agree more, and that's part of why investing in having a person, a actual person dedicated to making sure that it's live, it's relevant, it's clean, we're looking for any dead links and, and all of that. That'll be a regular routine um, process that's undertaken. And right now, we're just, uh, we have limited capacity to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the executive department? I am live. I, will, I, I don't have a question, but I will have a comment. I feel like the last time we updated the website, it took a really, really long time. Like, I can't remember. I feel like we talked about it for a year and a half or so. Um, I hope that this time it's not going to take as long, not as long of a birthing process. And I don't know, 
but it did feel like it took a really long time last time. Yeah, I think that will be one of the benefits of our reorganization. We'll, we're under one roof now, IT and communications, and so we should be able to move at a faster pace. Yeah. I did find my post. Please. <laughs> um, just wondering, the representation from the Organizational Development and Performance Division, why is this under the executive and not in the HR department? Well, that's a great question, and it is something we've struggled with, or not struggled, but we've had that question since the inception of really the work that it the that position does. Having the um, elevated status of being in the executive department, so it's over and connected to all of the divisions, all of the departments, and with the emphasis that this is a, a an expectation from the mayor and the leadership of the city, that's one reason why it's in the executive department. The other is it it really needs to remain neutral. So I always described it as being Switzerland. It's 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 a resource that employees have to do their jobs better, to develop their prof professionally, and it's not necessarily related to HR type development, which is could be more perceived more as disciplinary or a supervisor. We wanted that kind of neutrality so that it could be a little bit more than just um, supervisor manager training. We wanted to expand into other areas as well, processes and things that HR necessarily doesn't in involve themselves in business processes, um, process improvement, data. And those are part of the organizational development program, but not all of it. Does that make sense? I'm sorry if I'm not answering that well. Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Councilmember O'Howard. Just a um, little bit of background. My 30 plus years in uh, working in corporate uh, finance departments, um, I found the most effective internal education came as an independent body uh, within the organization so that it wasn't, it, there wasn't an expectation that because I'm a council member, I should only be interested in learning and growing as a council member. I don't want to, I, sh I shouldn't want to know about, you know, how to fix the the sewer truck or whatever, um, and and so it allowed it allowed employees to explore within the organization other opportunities and other growth areas or interest areas um, that wasn't necessarily tied to their current role. So that is a a large part of it is that cross cross departmental collaboration and the relationship building busting silos and making sure we know what's going on in all the other departments at the operational level. Sometimes that's, that's again, it goes beyond that supervisory management and performance type work. It's more about the systems and um, building that, that neutral, you're right, that, that's, that's what I mean by Switzerland. You've got to be neutral. It, it, the position started in finance, or the work started in finance, and then the position was placed in executive. Sure. Yes, Councilmember Alberson. I found my question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, it's actually a simple one. Uh, 2023, 2000, 2024 goals, you have replaced the phone system. What's wrong with the current phone system? It's at end of life. It, it's an a older system. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if I have my... Yes, I'll let Young speak specifically to it, but it's essentially it's at its end of life and we're not really okay. able to tap into some of the newer technologies. Okay. And so specifically, Young, yeah, I'm curious, coming from corporate America as well, you know, I, I oh, we get a new phone system and you get it and you're thinking, well, what did this, mm, what does this do that the other one didn't do? So can you speak to that just to? Well, so our current phone system, the MyTel phone system, it is an IP-based phone system, mm -hmm. uh, but the, phone, the kind of the next generation of phone systems we're looking at are, kind of the more cloud-based uh, Teams phone mm -hmm. type systems. <clears throat> and the hardware that we have, the kind of the brain of the Mitel system, uh, we've had now for over 10 years, I think. I, I'd have to I, mm -hmm. double check. But that hardware is now, um, end of life, we were given uh, extension on the 
uh, support coverage. Mm -hmm. So we have to pay for support beyond the, the life of the hardware. So we have to start looking at replacing it. Um, okay. Definitely much. The it's it's a lot cheaper now than it used to be. I think our phone, first phone system back in '99 or something was like a million, million five, and then the Mitel system I think was half that, and now that's even half that. Yeah. Yes. Kind of Recording in progress. Well, good. I'm glad you're going to catch Sorry, this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> While we have Young here, uh, the other goal: expand public Wi-Fi to the downtown core area. Um, I'm curious about the cost of that, and what is that? What kind of what does that expansion mean as far as, uh, and kind of where it is now, and the and what the goal is as far as accessibility and that sort of thing? Yeah. So the 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 goal is to do to study um, just public Wi-Fi coverage down mm -hmm. the downtown core area, and and just you know we, we need to do some research on you know wh where would we put coverage out you know where's where's going to be effective you know does it reach into businesses does it reach into um you know just people walking around with their phones and you know can they connect to it mm -hmm. uh, so this is you're going to look into it not necessarily is the goal to expand or the goal to it, it is expand but the research. part of that would be the to, to look at the how to expand it out most cost effective way is that to do how to in a the, yeah, do the initial planning and and mm -hmm. uh, like for the um, uh, the rec center expansion, we hired a consultant to come out and do a survey of the area of where the coverage would be best expanded, and we worked with the community services or recreation parks and recreation to uh, evaluate like where would where are people you know most or where are they hanging out you know where would be the most effective areas to put Wi-Fi, and and then we we had that kind of mapped out on on a on a Wi-Fi kind of level. And from a cost standpoint, is mm -hmm. that, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is, uh, I mean, it's always a, a good idea, but when you start to put numbers to it uh, and compare that to the value that's gotten out of that, I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out as far as where these numbers are and, and what that's going to entail. Yeah, we, we, uh, the, it, we find that the, we found that most likely it would be much more costly than doing like the rec center uh, Wi-Fi because of we'd have to dig up infrastructure to mm -hmm. get you know things into the ground. Um, I know that uh, we have like in the landing area. I think we have some infrastructure there that gives us a little bit easier access to add Wi-Fi equipment, but not mm -hmm. in the whole downtown. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Councilmember Vaughn. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, the department's presentation. Um, I have a question regarding uh, well, on page 311 uh, when we talk about the transfer of thirty thousand dollars of the discretionary uh, citywide uh, money for training and uh, organization development <clears throat> my question is is that enough and also as far as training and um, development organization does that include more of um, equity um, diversion include div diversity and inclusion training or is it more of a technical training i know that it's a new department right as far as like the combination of uh, the reorganization that we've done so just wanted to understand a little bit more sure um the thirty thousand dollars is is a really good start uh and we have some funding already yeah sure and ryan you may is ryan here okay we have ryan here too as well um <clears throat> Some of the training, and, and the reason for it is because we have now this position, the organizational development manager, that can focus and, and spend energy on delivering citywide training. And so it really was more about functionality, capacity to have it within the organizational development department or division. Um, what it is, it varies. So we're focused on the priorities of the city. We're working on providing Im improving competencies where employees need it most. We're providing training around technology, around tools, but we're also doing lean, which is process improvement training. So we have, we know we have a lot of processes that need 
leaning out that need um, assistance. And uh, so we're training people to do that. And we've and that's a continuation of what we've done in the past. Um, also project management, we're working on that. And we actually are, is it in two weeks, are having a equity in project management training. So some of the training will be around equity, but really every kind of training and development we do has the the fabric of equity and inclusion and all of that with woven within um, in particular the lean training is it's really very similar to the equity training because it talks about stakeholder input the voice of the customer and really what adds value to the people receiving services do you want to add any certainly sure. thank, thank you christy i would just add that we didn't transfer all of our training dollars to the organizational development fund we did retrain we did retain a good portion of them, and that will be used to train the mandatory subjects such as anti-harassment training, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to be launching some implicit bias training here in the next month. So we still do have the funds for those types of training. But one of the reasons why I thought it was a good partnership with organizational development is that they can cast a wider net on a variety of trainings. They're in the know, if you will, in terms of their networking capability to bring some of the most top of the line trainings to our city for our professional development that quite frankly, my department and I don't necessarily have the time to focus on while we're providing all of the other things that we do. So I thought it was a good partnership. Uh, Councilmember Helen. Yes, thank you. Um, just, excuse me, just uh, in keeping with our business um, plan, um, I, I haven't heard anything about training with an, uh, a lens toward cli taking climate action or identifying opportunities to take climate action. So I would like to, um, and I don't know if it's just too, if it's too early in the game. I know we're just trying to stand up our plan and stand up our team and all that stuff. But I would, uh, I, I would like to hear that there is an, at least an intent to include um, a little bit of that for our employees so that they can let us know where they see opportunities. I can absolutely speak to that, yes. So being a, a value and, and core function of the city, we will have training around that. With the plan stood up, a lot of what we're doing right now with lean and process improvement training, project management training, those will serve that effort well. Um, we'll be able to address problems with the tools that we're learning now and all of everything we're doing right now will lead up to being able to more effectively address the the, the goals of the business plan, including climate. Thank yes. you. Any other questions for the executive department? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we've got public works. Good evening, Chair Prince, members of the City Council. Here to present today the uh, Public Works Department budget for 23-24. Sorry, I'm getting oriented here. We'll... So as you see from our last um, budget, the only the, the big addition has been the uh, um, public buildings and facilities has been moved from into the Public Works Department. So you'll see that addition has been added on there as well as the work involved in the management of the public buildings. Otherwise, our, our mission statement, our core services the same, maintain the same, which is to develop, build, and maintain the infrastructure of the city. Our proposed budget and proposed additions for this year on the operating side, the downtown parking garage security contract, uh, $120,000 a year for two years. This is for continue to provide security to the downtown parking garage in an effort to um, deal with some of the uh, challenges that exist with uh, some of the patrons who utilize the area or visit the area, as well as allow the, the patrons who do use the parking structure to feel safe. We'd gotten a number of complaints earlier this year, had a lot of activity in terms of um, illicit drug use and other issues that, that went on there, vandalism, destruction of public property. So with the uh, we added the um, security contract earlier this year. Um, it's 
certainly proven to be effective. And this uh, is a sort of a reduction in the level of services that we currently have. But we'll, we believe that one of those things was to start out strong with a long-term presence and then start to bring it down as we start to better manage that particular uh, area. Um, airport operation expenses increase of 57,000. What you'll see from a lot of these um, increases are really as a result of supply chain issues, as well as uh, inflationary factors that affect the metals industry, the commodities industries, um, and just our ability to continue to provide the level of service at the dollar amounts and, uh, within the requirements that we have, um, and that requires more funding. We also have our 2024 Comprehensive Utility Rate Study. Previously, rate studies have been done every two years, but we have not fund, we have not put them as a, a, as a particular budgeted item. It's something where we always looked at funds that were left over and then utilized them. And I think it's a particularly important for the council to understand that you know these, these utility studies are important for us to ensure that we look at sort of all the factors that can influence our ability to deliver our utilities effectively and efficiently and in order to be able to, to sort of guard against the cost of inflation and the other factors that can impact our revenue we want to make sure that we provide the lowest possible budget or lowest possible cost to the rate payers while at the highest level of service that we can perform so having these comprehensive rate studies done every two years really prepare us for setting the rates and doing so in a as i said in a, in a, in a really wholesome and all-encompassing manner and then, as council may be aware, we also added our sustainability section this year to public works. Um, we added the people, but we didn't add the operating expenses. And so as we stand that up this coming year, just starting to try and get folks on board, we need some operating expenses, paper clips, paper, well, it shouldn't be paper, but more print, uh, more ink, more digital um, information that we'll need in order to provide, start moving out and, and uh, expanding our, our sustainability operating group. And then the NPDS fee increase of $60,000. This is where we've seen an increase in the fees coming back from the state for the cost of our, our annual permit um, for our NPDS program. The other thing you'll see is our a, a little increase in the size of our department. Um, in 2022, we added, again, five people as a result of the sustainability um, section, as well as the additional folks we added to solid waste for the community cleanup. We added two additional solid waste where I sort of said maintenance worker one workers to the uh, operating department or maintenance section so that they can go out and double the amount of effort we have removing trash and and um, dis um, illegally disposed items in, in our public right of ways. So in the budget, well, as part of the budget, what you'll see is proposed changes in our rates for the coming year. Our water rates, based on that comprehensive utility study, we believe that with our, our funding that we have in both our reserves and our revenue and our operating expenses and capital expenses, we can go through two years without increasing the uh, water rates. So we're going to have zero water rate increases for 23 and 24. Wastewater, because of the needs and some of the large capital expenses we have coming up there, we've got you know 3% increase in 2023 and 3% increase proposed for 2024. Surface water, 4%, same thing for 2023 and 2024. So just an example, you'll see a typical single family residential bill. It's really going to go up a buck 58 per month in 2023 and a buck 64 per month in 2024. Um, in addition, we we're talking about our system development charges. Um, these are for new development fees as a result of um, adding, basically buying into the existing infrastructure. The community as a whole has paid for the infrastructure over time, and that capacity that these people are buying into um, allows them to um, tie into the existing systems without having to build their own. Um, large, we have conveyance systems, treatment systems, all those things that allows, affords them the opportunity to do that. These system development fees, we've looked at an increase of 350 in water, um, 150 in wastewater, and 200 in surface water. This is a result of the changes in the value of our existing infrastructure. As we've made improvements over time, added new water towers, um, rehabilitated pump stations, added new pipeline, that increases the value of the system. So as, we, as they buy into that, that share of their cost goes up. And so that's why we're seeing an increase in our system development charges. Our solid waste recycling and composting fees um, are going to go up this year, again, based on our, our review of the rates 
and inflation and contractual obligations to Republic services as a result of the agreement with the city. We're seeing um, high inflation um, in the area, I think as of July when the, or June when the contract said that we looked at the cost of living and that was what the basis for Republic service charges is in 2023 would be the inflation at that month was 10%, over 10%. So while they aren't getting a 10% raise because our contract does have a cap at 8%, they will see an 8% increase in their contract. In addition, we've had increase from the um, King County Solid Waste um, Department for our disposal and, and transfer facilities. Those have increased almost 9%. And then we also, uh, Council will recall, we also looked at last year balancing the rates when we came forward with the last increase because we had um, a huge subsidy going towards the residential sector, certainly much more so than normally. And so we came up with a plan to reduce that over a five-year period of time, which council adopted. And so that also impacts the rates to a bit. And then we've also added, again, two additional solid waste employees to deal with the community um, cleanup issues, um, as well as uh, some additional resources to sustainability. So all that together have really added to the increase in the rates. So what you're seeing is the single family rates will go up $7, 7.75% 7 in 23 and 24. If we looked at the actual cost, we're actually going to draw down on the reserves a little bit to do this, but we didn't want to keep it. When we looked at what the actual rates were, if we just assumed all costs, they would have been over 8% per year. And so in trying to understand the, the issues that folks are dealing with and continue to provide the level of service that has been expected um, in the community, we wanted to make sure that we can um, provide a, a good product, but at a very reasonable cost. And we think we've got some excess for reserves that have built up over time that we can draw down a little bit to keep that cost and that increase down. The commercial and multifamily sector will go down um, 6.9 and 6.8% in the two years, and the roll-off um, will go 5.7% increase and 5%. So overall, it's about a 7.2% increase when you meld the rates together, but these are the rate, proposed rate increases for each sector. So what does Public Works do? What do we spend this large budget on. And I'm just going to kind of go through this briefly, but just to give you an idea of the, the, the types of infrastructure that we maintain, we've got a large number of traffic signals, over 5,000 street lights that we maintain, you know, flashing school beacon, rapid speed feedback signs, crosswalk flashers. We have over 20,000 street signs, um, channelization, sort of the, the, the delineators that provide for um, between the lanes to ensure people don't run over things. We have almost 1.8 million linear feet or about 345 miles. Um, thermoplastic, again, I can give you, read the statistics, but you can see them. Um, the airport, we've got a large airport, 170 acres, a 5,300 length runway. And we've got about 280 total aircraft at the airports, takeoffs and landing operations, over 132,000 operations. And then we've got over 129 leases at the airport that we manage and maintain. Um, our utilities, our water, wastewater, and surface water, you can see we've got a large number of customers, over 24,000 surface water, and about 18 to 19,000 water and wastewater. Our service areas are fairly large, both inside and outside the city. Um, you can see our total water sales, but the, the infrastructure itself, the pipelines, the length of pipelines, miles of pipelines that we have, the number of wells and springs, reservoirs, pump stations, treatment facilities, pressure reducing valve stations, a number of fire hydrants, a number of valves. The valves are really important because that's when we have a break, we can shut it off so we're not having to cut lots of people off if we have good valve exercise program and then lo locally nearby where you can isolate the number of people who are affected by the shutoff. So valves are a really important effort in this infrastructure. You can see our wastewater section, the lift stations, the miles of pipe, force mains or mains where we have a pump station that pumps the water uphill or the wastewater uphill to a uh, line that then feeds it by gravity. So we've got over five miles of force main, which is under pressure to move water uphill. And then we have 67 maintenance access structures or essentially openings where we can gain access to the sewer. Our surface water, again, the miles of pipes, number of facilities, number of catch basins, the maintenance, all these things have to be maintained and checked in requirements for the best management practices or as requirements of our NPDES permit. Sort of our solid waste, just an idea of the customer count, square mileage are the same, the, the total tons of garbage collected, the total tons of recycled, and the total tons of organics collected. 
um, our streets. We have over 318 um, center miles of streets, 753 miles of, of lane lines, um, over 450 pavement line, I should say 450 lane miles of pavement markings. Um, we talked about street signs, city owned street lights, signalized intersections, et cetera. So our pavement condition index. So I'm sorry, I just go back to that real quick. This is just to kind of give you an overview of the, the type and breadth of infrastructure that's maintained and operated by the Public Works Department. Um, our pavement condition index is, index is something we've talked about before. We've come to the Committee of the Whole and talked a little bit about our existing pavement conditions. As you can see, overall, we're about a 71% pavement condition X index, PCI. Um, we don't want to drop below that. We don't want to drop below 70. It's one of our goals. And it's an important goal because as you can see that from the graph up at the top right, as you get to the fair air to the below 70, it starts to rapidly drop pretty quickly and without maintain, making those ma maintenance efforts, while it's good, satisfactory and fair, you can see a pavement deterioration by quickly and the cost of making the investment and maintaining it versus the cost of reconstruction or new construction of road is substantially less by maintaining it than, in, than having to invest in new roadways. So our goal is to keep our roads in relatively good shape um, at, that, at that fair category above, um, and that's gonna require some investment. And we certainly are seeing because of the drop in the PCI, the amount of investments that's needed to be made is not keeping up with the, with the needs to do that. And we'll be coming back to the committee to hold this, discuss that further. In addition, sidewalks. Now, one of the things we've talked about before was we're doing data on our sidewalks. This is kind of giving an overview. You can see all the red area are areas where there are no sidewalks in the city. These are, we have finally been able to complete the inventory of our sidewalk walkway or a, a preliminary inventory. It's, we're in the process of sort of doing the uh, review and, and, and checking the data. But essentially, we have 196 miles of missing sidewalk within the city. And these are in residential areas, um, certain other areas of the city. Um, we have 357 miles of existing sidewalk, but we have a street frontage, a length of street frontage of 553 miles. So in order to make sure that we have walkways for people, obviously, there's a substantial investment that needs to be there, needs to be made in the sidewalks as we go forward. And how are we going to be able to do that? So we're going to come back to the council with a proposal for the formation of a transportation benefit district. It's one of the options for, I think we've talked about that before for council to consider. Um, the funding for the transportation benefit district is proposed to be used for the maintenance of existing streets and construction repair of existing and missing sidewalks. Um, this is part of the move ahead Washington plan that was approved in 2022, which expanded the authority to develop TBDs. Um, it actually allows a councilmatic vote to impose a one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax. And that sales ta additional sales tax would then be generated um, for the investment in these streets and sidewalks. You know, if we look at that, going back to this 196 miles of missing sidewalk, um, the Association of Washington City had a general assessment about $250,000 per mile of sidewalk. So that 196 miles of missing sidewalk is about $49 million worth of investment. We're gonna, obviously, we're not going to make that in the short term, but we've got to start someplace and uh, we want to come back and talk to you about how we can do that and the ability to use the transportation benefit as a tool to do that. Next, I want to talk about the grant work. Um, I'm, you know, I like to brag about the amount of work that the staff and public works have done in terms of gathering grants and in, in terms of applying for and seeing grants. We have received a number of grants through um, our transportation system, um, our utilities, our stormwater, um, wastewater, and water systems, and, and then in our airports and our facilities. Um, basically, for 21-22, the city received over $49 million in grant. Well, $49 million, but I have to take $14 million of that from the Family First Community Center because that's a combination of grants, donations, as well as a $5 million um, um, investment by the city so if i look at outside grant purposes it's almost 40 million dollars in grants that the city's received to benefit from as a result of the hard work of everybody who in public works as well as you know for the family first community center the folks in parks and recreation kelly and her folks who have worked really hard in gathering the funds for the family first center um in addition to russ woodruff and public works facilities and 
and Jeff and Nishi, they've all done a great job. Um, Jim Seitz and Ron Strzok, I can sort of name everybody, the folks at the airport. But for the city to receive almost, you know, as I said, approximately 35 million, almost $40 million in grants in a two year period, I think it's something these folks would be very, really proud of. And it's a tremendous, tremendous contribution to the community. So I just want to kind of go through some of the work that we did last year and accomplished, just the highlights and then what we're going to see coming forward in the capital improvement program that's in the budget for you for your consideration so wells and williams we finally got that completed we're working on the final paperwork at this point in time but there's no other construction being incur to occur at that site the uh Hauser way project and pedestrian improvements the lake washington loot trail phase three um Renton Elementary and Middle School crossings, uh, the rapid flashing beacons, um, the Duval project, which is currently under construction with the addition of pavement restoration and adding sidewalks along the stretch there from 7th Street, 7th Place to Northeast Sunset Boulevard. Um, the Bronson Way Bridge painting which, painting, which just opened last Friday, we got the painting done, so then we're gonna come back and have to do the seismic retrofit next year, but we'll revisit that again, but that's, again, the work is continuing to move forward. So what we have coming forward the next year, Park Avenue North Extension. Um, as you may be aware, we finally got the maintenance and operation agreement from the, the railroad. Um, we are currently in the process of looking at that to see what other items we need to include in the bids. And then we'll be going out for bids hopefully early next month for the Park Avenue North Extension. The Rainier Avenue South Quarter Improvements Phase 4 from third all the way up to third place just um, north of the airport. That work is currently out to bid. We should see bid openings. Jim, I believe it's this week? This week. Yeah. This week. Um, we'll see the bids. See that that's estimated to be about $23 million construction project. Um, in addition, we also have funding set aside for the Bronson Way seismic work and Hauser Way and William Avenue painting and seismic work. So a couple other bridge works that we'll be working on. And certainly, just to assure you now, we're not going to close all three bridges at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Make that public. Uh, but we will be working those in phases as we move forward. Um, and then our 40, South 43rd Street Overlay and ADA Ramp Project, um, Lake Washington Traffic Calming Project. These are our first speed humps that will be going in the city. Um, we are now in the process of doing design for the section between Burnett and Hauser Way. And then we have certainly five other projects that are out there that we'll be moving forward for um, traffic calming in the years to come, year to come, year two years to come. In utility system, We've got our downtown, again, the downtown utility improvement project, which um, was a great project, installed a lot of infrastructure necessary to facilitate the development of the downtown. You know, we started March 1st, 2021, finished early, five months ahead of construction and under the engineer's estimate. So the total construction cost is 13 to almost 1.7 million under the engineer's estimate. So uh, Joe, uh, Joe um, and uh, folks in, Utilities should be really proud of the work that they did there. Um, Jefferson Ave Northeast 16th Street stormwater improvements. This is a, where we added the stormwater sections and repaving work to allow for infiltration and treatment of uh, natural treatment of stormwater. Um, we completed a lot of plans and regulatory requirements, such as we adopted our water system plan, the 10 year update, the surface water utility system plan, the long range wastewater plan. These all lay out the infrastructure and operational um, requirements for the years going ahead and allows us to move um, and advance those things in a very coordinated manner. Um, we've also done a lot of other work in our um, programs and plans for the utilities. Um, a really good thing about the uh, folks in, in utility and work that they've done, you know, they've spent, their CIT expenditures were almost $26 million of CIT expenditures in the two-year period so a lot of investment that's been made into the community and we funded that with about 2.5 million in grants um, we also have coming forward the highland 435 zone reservoir project which is this reservoir right here if you can see the cursor um, it's about a 22 million project 22.7 million dollar project um, well actually 30 million dollar project construction is is um that's maybe about 22.7 but as we continue to move forward we'll we'll refine those numbers the Highlands Water Main Improvements, these are um, to uh, assist with the Sunset Garden Offset water, water System Improvements. And again, we got a CHIP grant for that, um, which also helps offset some of the cost. Um, our Water Main Replacement Program, 
These are water main replacements in some of the older areas of the city to help facilitate um, the efficient and effective and high quality water that we wanted our residents to enjoy. You know, as part of our water system plan, it called for about a 1.5 million in investment each year in order to continue to replace the um, outdated and, and uh, nearing the end of life pipes that we have in the, in the system out there. Um, the Kennedale Lake Line sewer upgrade will also be coming forward in the next two year period. We'll continue work on design. The construction is planned to start in 2025. So we'll continue to work through that design and the issues associated with that. Monroe Avenue Northeast um, and 2nd Street Infiltration System Improvement Project. This is a big stormwater infiltration um, project that will deal with a lot of the water that exists in, in that, that Monroe Avenue area and, and caused a lot of flooding. Um, this will help take that and treat it now that we're seeing the uh, Sahali gravel pit fill up, which if we've been using that temporarily for water infiltration, and now that that site's going to be used, we're going to build this infiltration site next to it or on it in a small portion of it in cooperation with them. And then we've got our Southeast 172nd and 125th Northeast Storm System improvements, I guess the adding to uh, a storm system to relieve some of the flooding in the neighborhoods. And in our facilities group, um, they've done a great job in terms of dealing with cell phone towers and really improving the inf infrastructure for our fire pumps, boilers, generators, an IT server room, or AC here at the uh, City Hall, replacing the lighting in downtown parking garage with LEDs, um, reducing our cost and impact. Um, and then our goals for the coming year, completion of the Family First Community Center. Um, it's been going great guns. We've got pretty much the thing framed up. Our contractor has been really taking advantage of the good weather and trying to get everything up and ready to go before the bad weather hits and they can start moving indoors. We'll also complete our phase three ESCO projects, which are um, essentially energy efficiency improvement projects in the city, um, whether it's City Hall or the Renton Community Center or it's City Works Yard. Um, we'll also take a look at plan development or customer engagement process to make sure we have a a feedback process loop for our folks so we can know when we're we're meeting our, our um, performance standards and then work on service level agreements for all city buildings maintenance services to folks just an idea of the work that they did they've actually we've got some really skilled folks in the maintenance services department who have basically been taking our pump stations and rewiring them um, and labeling all the wires i mean they are um, a person with ADD's dream, every wire has a tag on it, so it knows exactly where it's supposed to go. It, I go in there and I'm, I'm just uh, amazed by the work that they've done, really high quality work and have really improved our system at a fraction of the cost by having it done versus um, contractors. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of the other things they've done, they rebuilt their pump motors, um, variable speed drives installs. Essentially, we've done it for 125,000 over something that we estimate contractors would do almost 650,000 because of the skills and ability of our folks. And then, uh, and again, maintenance services, again, a new paver, and we've been doing a certain a lot more paving. We've increased our, our paving production from 50 tons daily to almost uh, double that and triple that. Um, we're doing full lane paving, quicker turnaround, increasing our, again, contributing to our pavement maintenance, our pavement condition index by being able to do some of the repairs ourselves rather than contracting at all. We've also painted a lot of our reservoir tanks using our own crews. They've uh, sandblasted them and come back and painted them. That saved us, again, about each site's about $20,000. So for the three tanks that they've did, about 60,000 cost, probably 10% of what it would cost us to hire contractors to do that. And our airport, um, continue to look at things that we're doing there. We've completed design of the new airport administrative offices. The airport layout plan update has been completed. We've gotten sign off from the FAA so now we don't have to worry about the issues associated with the mass plan, the extension of the runway out into the lake or into downtown. In the interim period, we now have an all uh, airport layout plan that utilizes the existing um, aircraft designation and doesn't require those things for years. We'll obviously have to look at that in the years to come, but at this point in time, there's no requirement for us to, to go beyond where we're at now. And then we've completed removal of the northeast corner derelict buildings as we talked a little bit about today in the transportation subcommittee about those uh, old hangars that were dilapidated and broken down and, and contaminated. We've had those those removed on site. So proposed in 2024, we're going to do 23-24, the taxiway alpha paving, the airport office relocation. The folks now are in the office underneath the uh, control tower. 
um, in a seismic event, the control tower will collapse on the building. So we want to remove our staff out of there. Um, and hopefully we get the uh, funding from the federal government for the structural retrofit of the uh, uh, control tower. But in the meantime, we want to make sure our folks are safe. Um, this feeder liver log removal, which is a result of some um, FEMA funding we received. And then we've received um, airport improvement program grant funding from the FAA for taxway alpha rebuild. And we were completing our, our engineer's assessment for the parking area near the maintenance building. We're having some, we're seeing our soil sink, our parking lots start to sink as a result of uh, the infill of the uh, Cedar River over time, where they basically threw out what we've done by doing some borings and then we found that underneath the pavement, people just threw a bunch of wooden boards under there. Now that stuff has deteriorated over time. We're going to have to deal with uh, trying to prop that up. Our new section, solid waste and sustainability and solid waste, is going to really there to, uh, as we talked about before, to really advance our sustainability efforts because so much of what we do is either program or construction and we want to make sure we do those in the most sustainable way possible. So, you know, things we've accomplished, um, recycling events, um, we've been co-leading the clean economy strategy with the folks in community economic development. Um, we're looking at a city, a Department of Commerce EV infrastructure planning grant, and we piloted residential anti-recycling contamination cart tagging program to increase, uh, improve and increase our recycle collect recyclables that we collect. So our goals for 23-24, adopt our clean economy strategy plan initiatives, really work on our electric vehicle infrastructure plan to build capacity, increase the implement our sustainability, our climate actions and environmental programs to benefit the community. We've already done some training in our group. Um, we've trained our, our uh, project managers on, or some of our project managers on Envision, which is a sustainability rating system for capital projects. Um, we're increasing the quantity and the quality of recyclables. Again, back to our studies to, um, excuse me, ensure that we are making sure we're reducing the amount of contamination in our compostable and recycling programs. <coughs> I must be at the limit of my talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continuing to work on a development, adopt a zero waste plan, increase food quality, waste composting, and increase residential and youth water quality and conservation education outreach programs as uh, obviously water conservation will continue to be an important goal in the Northwest as uh, climate change occurs. I have reached the end of my, my speaking. So, <laughs> Martin. Uh, uh, Council Member Perez. Uh, thank you, Martin. You did an absolutely great job and, and you bring me so many memories of when Greg Zimmerman was presenting and we always say, make it as short as possible because at the end, <laughs> half of the council was <laughs> you know, sleeping. And it's not that it's entertaining, but always works. You know, how the tendency to be that department to, it's very hard to make it in, incredibly interesting for some folks. Uh, but I have to say that in the, with all the respect to all the department heads, that in the eight years that I have been a council member, I think this is the most comprehensive and complete presentation that I have seen and also that I have read. Because um, you brought the presentation, it's about numbers. And numbers tend the tendency to be boring, but numbers tell a story. And it tells me where the money is going and has a lot of statistics. What it showed me where you guys are working and where are we going planning to be in the future. I really like these presentations. Kudos to all the public works department because it, your numbers show how hard and heavy everybody in that department is working. So I have just a few questions because again, your budget is so complete that I almost, you know, you answer everything or or with the written presentation or with the this presentation that again, I spent a couple of hours seeing because I thought it was very fascinating, uh, that nerd I am. But anyway, on page 115, uh, you are adding that the proposed budget for utilities include an increase in 3.6 million for the payment to garbage contractor, which is Republic Service. I think these 3.6 million were already, are already in the contract. So it's something that we own. But in the goals, which again, I said, every single division goals are very ambitious and I love them because they are very in sync with the community needs. One of the goals is provide for successful implementation and sustainability on solid waste section program. Within the problems that we had this year, 
uh, at the beginning of the year during the winter uh, with a Republic Service. I remember you came to the cow early in the year to give us a lot of ideas that you were going to guys to implement to avoid these pro pro problems in the future. Can you really quick brief us, where are we with these plans? Because winter is coming. Yes. <laughs> so our hope is that we don't have this problem. I can't guarantee it. Um, but we have made some efforts with, uh, with Republic Services in the last year. I think part of one of the things we've really found out was communication was really, I think, one of the biggest issues that we had. The ability to communicate to the public what was happening, when it was happening, and how it was happening. And we've had some leadership changes at Republic Services, so we're, we're, we're working with them, but we will certainly um, work with them again this year in terms of making sure that we, we looked at really coming up with a comprehensive messaging about how we message, who messages, and when they message it, and trying to make sure we get out there. And again, it's not just a one-time thing. We got to keep repeating it over and over again so that we can get to as many people as possible. Um, but I, I'm really the biggest key to us was messaging. You know, they got out there when they could to perform. Um, obviously, on the hills and things like that, they couldn't run their trucks up those hills. So, you know, but we need to make sure people understood that. And then we need to make sure that people understood what the options are. And I think part of that was just negotiating that in advance. And we'll certainly work on getting those done again this coming year. Thank you, Marcy. Councilmember Howard. Yes, thank you. I actually have two questions on completely unrelated topics. Um, I'll start with the first one on your. Um, Rolling Hills, South Talbot, and Mount Olivet Reservoir tanks. I would like to again reiterate opportunity here to do some beautification and have some murals on those reservoirs now that they have been repainted. Again, I'll say I don't think Kennedale is the only neighborhood that gets to have a beautiful mur mural on their reservoir tank. So, um, and thank you. And I will uh, come back to my other question after other people have a chance. Okay. If I if I could just respond to that we we certainly hear you and part of that is that we'll look at the reservoirs that have the ability for people to be seen. We don't want to necessarily paint a reservoir if nobody can see it, but the ones that can be seen are certainly something we've talked about. So this was really just doing the base painting. Now we have the the blank canvas, so to speak. We can certainly look at those. Thank you, Councilmember Vaughn. Yes, I thank you, Chair, and I feel the love from Councilmember Halloran over there in terms of Kennedy's comment. Um. <laughs> um Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Thank you so much. Um, on page 315, I have a question in terms of migration of work orders and GIS system um, into integrated uh, asset management system. What is kind of the, the timeline, if you can, um, if you have a timeline, and, and just to kind of better educate me and, and the council and kind of the, the vision of that? Sure. So the city's got a work order system been running out in the uh, maintenance services department for a while. And that maintenance work order system is where the folks go out and record what they do and then we record that data in, into a database. Um, and then we also have our GIS system, which records a lot of the data we have, uh, you know, where all our piping's at, where our valves are at, reservoirs, all those things on there. One of the things and one is I've been talking with the staff about and one of the things we need to do is sort of migrate to the next level, which is to take that data and compile it into an asset management system so we can utilize that to make decisions. We've been very fortunate in this city that we have folks who have a lot of long tenure, folks who have a lot of institutional memory, but those folks are nearing the end of their career. And so in order to prepare for the future, we got to make sure we have all that data and be able to put it in a place where somebody can look at that and make data differences data-driven decisions on infrastructure replacement. We'll, it, we'll say when we look at 1.5 miles or 1.5 million in water line replacements, we want to make sure we look at that in terms of knowing the age of the pipe, the type of material the pipe is, the number of breaks that have occurred over the time, um, you know, whether it's a deteriorating type of pipe, all those things that can provide us good data for the engineers to take a look at. And it's just one more, one more piece of information to evaluate and prioritize our infrastructure as we go forward. It also allows us to take a look at that, again, back to looking at factors based on material types. Sometimes you want to replace because some material is really bad. Um, corrugated metal pipes from our stormwater system, and we've talked a little bit about those and the need to replace those because they deteriorate over time. As we take that information and videotape it, we'll put that in both and some we've ident certainly identified the ones that need to be done now, and that's the good, great idea behind our folks who are doing the CCTV work with their cameras on those systems. But we can't do it all. So part of it is understanding that assessment and comparing that to other sections to figure out which ones first 
which one should be done first based on the funding that we have available. So it's really to take data and use it to make decisions. It's just another tool for the folks or our engineering folks to make better decisions. I shouldn't say better decisions, make decisions about how we're gonna utilize the uh, available funding that we have. So in terms of the time frame, sorry, I almost skirted that one. No, <laughs> I totally understand, but go ahead. Yeah, this is something, obviously, it's not a, a one-year process. It's a multi-year process because we've got to look at our systems. We've got to make sure that our software, we get the software updated and get the right version that we need. We need to make sure that we've got the training involved for the folks so that when they do it, we can make sure the data that's gone in is done in completely and, and correctly. And then we can also you know, want to make sure we may have to have some infrastructure, some tablets and things like that that our crews can use so we can reduce the amount of paperwork that have. So that things can be done electronically and implemented immediately, but that requires training, that requires um, some infrastructure to, to support that. So this is something we're going to work on, and, and uh, first part is sort of get the everybody on the same page, and then work with our IT folks, which we have been doing already, um, to really identify the plan and the milestones as we move forward. Council President McGurvin. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask the first one on transportation, and then maybe I'll get another opportunity on um, the uh, on sustainability uh, after others have gone. Um, Martin, you you made me think of a question that maybe was better out suited for um, parks and recreation, um, but I'll ask it here because the transportation benefit district, in my mind, seems like it could also be used to support um, uh, bicycles and trails as well. Um, is that something that we are also planning for? Um, and if so, uh, would that also necessitate completing a, an update of the um, bikes and, and trails and bicycle master plan um, during this next cycle to support that as well? And I, I suppose the follow up would be is um along those same lines the, the the dollar amount was pretty large as far as um the amount we would need for to fully build out our sidewalks granted we're not going to do it all at once um are there other revenue sources we've ex explored such as a bond or a levy to help uh construct sidewalks and additional um pedestrian facilities thank you certainly um our bikes and trails mass plan i think was adopted in 2018 so i'm not sure we need to do the update at this point in time we may need to do it in the near future and i can't speak from the trails side of it i can only speak from the bicycle side of it um, we certainly have a lot of projects that are identified in there that need to be completed. Uh, as far as whether the Transportation Benefit District can fund that, that certainly, if it's on the roadway, it certainly would be a, an eligible expense. I think the problem we, concern we have, as, we, as you saw, the large number of dollars that we have to invest in both sidewalks and streets, um, how much do we dilute those dollars? If we do a, the one-tenth of one percent would roughly equal about 3.5 to $3.8 million per year in revenue for from a transportation benefit district split that between sidewalks and streets you know that's you know basically one two million dollars for streets 1.8 million for sidewalks or the other way around however you get it it's still going to be a long time to get to those to, to really start to make a dent in those vacant places so the more we add things now when we do investments in streets can we look at making sure we have bike lanes on them where the width is available um certainly those are things that as we do street improvements as we can make pavement markings and things like that to improve and add bike lanes, we will certainly do that as part of this particular effort. Um, but, you know, if we have to buy, if, if we have to acquire right away um, and move parking and those sorts of things, it starts to increase the cost of those bike lanes, which is one of the problems that we, we have. So part of our efforts is going to be to take a look at the bike lanes and really start to facilitate how do we prioritize those and prioritize those in terms of making sure that people have routes to get to places. Maybe not all the routes, but they have routes to get places. So we can make sure that there is a designated route for bicycles to use, sort of our first phase, and then we can obviously expand and move forward from there. Um, but I think it's up to the council to decide what you want to put in there. But I, our concern would be just how much do we dilute those available dollars that we have. Um, by bonding, I think the concern with bonding is we can certainly bond for as much as you want. It's the repayment back and that annual payment that's going to go back to paying for those bonds. And what you bond is for the infrastructure you get at that one time. I don't know that we're going to be able to bond for the whole $49 million. It's an awfully large number just for sidewalks. And so, again, back to and, and our ability to put $49 million of sidewalk in a relatively short period of time when it's, uh, based on the amount of time we'd have to make those investments would be really difficult for us. Um, probably difficult for the citizens as well as we would pretty much tear up most of the streets in some parts of town. So, you know, it's one of those things we have to work out over time, but I think it's truly as we come back to discuss these further, there'll be certainly 
um, something for the council to consider and, and give us feedback on as we, we talk about the transportation benefit district moving forward. Councilmember Alberson, then Councilmember Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to stick to the the sidewalks thing. As I was reading through everything, I was looking everywhere I could, and I just wrote down sidewalk, sidewalk, sidewalks, and that sort of thing. I know we've talked about it, uh, so I'm glad you uh, addressed uh, addressed that in your presentation. And I know you say you're going to be coming and talking to us. I guess my question is um, concerning the the numbers we have now, and you you just said 49 million. I don't. I was looking for some numbers associated with that. Obviously, not the the whole kit and caboodle and that and that sort of thing. But as far as some of the numbers that you've proposed right now, um, are are any of them uh, any of the numbers really geared towards maybe some of the high priority areas? Or are we just really you pushing that towards the transportation benefit uh, district as far as getting started with the sidewalks? I don't know if they've been prioritized uh, as to where. I mean. Obviously, we have the number that you mentioned in, in miles or whatever it was, but um, I, I guess my my question is, what what do we of the of the numbers you have now that you're that you're proposing, how much of any of that is maybe geared toward some 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 new sidewalks and that sort of thing, or if at all? So, what we've talked about is again, we've we've identified the need. We haven't prioritized it yet, and that's some work we have to do some more work on. And we've got to come up with a prioritization schedule in terms of why. So part of it's going to be looking at things like the SAM project. I think we presented to the Committee of the Whole earlier about how we're using going out to the neighborhoods and gathering information about what are the travel routes that people use. We've been doing that now for the uh, West Hill as well as the Highlands area. So as we get that data there, we'll sort of take a look at replicating that other areas to try and figure out what those, again, back to those routes, providing routes for people to get to places they want to go and what are the highest priority routes. The ones that have been the highest identified use, that will help identify what the priorities will need to be. And then there's still a lot of folks who want to be able to walk in our neighborhoods. And so do we need to, you know, put sidewalks on both sides of the street? Maybe part of it is we only look at one side of the street, but at least people have a pathway to get there. Um, so those are some of the things that we'll have to come back with you with the recommended um, priorities in terms of how we do it. But I think, first of all, we want to make sure that people have pathways to get to the things that they want to get to first, like make sure that we've got clear bus stops, clear pathways for the kids walking to and from school, um, you know, taking a look at shopping centers, making sure that the residential and, and the commercial sectors, there's some connectivity there to allow people to walk and use bicycles to get to those particular locations. So, you know, we've, again, we haven't prioritized, prioritized these yet. This is just really preliminary data that I probably put this out here um, on this presentation and Jim's probably cringing because it was really just our preliminary data, but I really thought it was important as we consider the budget that the needs that we aren't addressing also be identified here. And that's something we, you know, I think the council has talked to us about for the last few years. I want to make sure you know that we were trying to work on that. Councilmember Howard and Councilmember Perez. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, and I'm I'm going to stick with the sidewalks as well. Um, I noticed in your graph that um, the Highlands and Benson are the you know the the highest uh, percentage of fair and or poor and very poor. Um, and these are older communities, not necessarily by age of when they've been in the city of Renton, but just older neighborhoods. And I mean, I live in Heather Downs in the Highlands. And so my question, you touched on it a little bit, but my, my question is when you go into an older community, where do you get the extra footprint to put in a sidewalk? So this particular map here, this is the uh, roadways. This is not the sidewalk. So this okay. is the condition index of roads. I'm sorry if I didn't explain that. No, that's well. okay. Um, but when we look at that, and then that's part of the part of the problem, as I, I talked about before, we'll take a look at, we certainly, we'll certainly have some right away with mo a lot of locations where we, we have the ability to do it. If we, one of the things we may have to look at our standards and whether we decide to put curb adjacent sidewalks. So you put curbs right adjacent to the curb, as opposed to with a planter area before you put sidewalks, just because of the need to acquire right away or whether we can get permission from everybody, will people give us that right away to put sidewalks in? Um, so if we can use the existing right away to the extent possible, that's what we'll try and do um, to try and keep the cost down. Because again, all those things, the more you have to acquire, the more the cost goes up. 
So it's, you know, taking a look at the areas, I think if you look at the 16th and Jefferson project, you saw uh, in that particular one where we were able to add sidewalks in areas where they didn't exist because it was in the right of way. We were able to add some areas for, for, um, for the infiltration basins. So, you know, and there's some places where we're not gonna be able to have them. We'll have to come back to the residents and say, hey, the only way we'll be able to put it in is if you're willing to, you know, provide us right away in order to put the sidewalks in. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen. So it's gotta be, you know, Unfortunately, the city's inherited a lot of this, these conditions from county islands that have been annexed over time that certainly didn't have sidewalks and it wasn't their standards at the time they were built. Um, so in order to address that, we're all going to have to get sort of creative and uh, participative in, in the process. Thank you. Press. Thank you. Great question, Council Member O'Halloran, because I was thinking exactly about uh, uh, in the ben during the Benson Hill annexation from Puerto Rico, this south from Petrovsky, uh, I don't think there is any sidewalks in that neighborhood, so so it's going to be interesting. But that was not my question. I have a follow up with a couple of things. First, um, when we built the reservoir on 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 Kennedale, I don't remember if within the budget that we have for the reservoir was adding the art or that money came from the art commission. Because I remember that the Art Commission had a, a, a role on this, um, and I'm just trying to brainstorm, but when planning and development come, maybe we can also well, talk I'll ask Ron Straka because he probably will know that um, answer. Better institutional memory than I have, certainly. <laughs> I don't remember if it was part of the budget or it was part of the plan Art, Art Commission's um the mural was funded by the water utility it was it was a requirement of city code that uh for new reservoirs that they be have art put on them so the water utility funded the uh mural for the, for the kennedale reservoir thank you so much i couldn't remember well and if i may i have one more um one of the goals that I love the most in, in your in your in your material was in the maintenance services division. Say additional resources to increase cleaning the city of Renton right on ways. I don't think uh, I don't re ever remember receiving an email uh, of people complaining about the public works department. I mean specifically uh, the staff and public works. The people really appreciate them. People really really. Um, are very grateful for the work that they that they do for the city however they do complain a lot about about uh, vegetation overgrowing or just garbage around the railways um i love the fact that it's a, a, an ad for additional resources for this um do you have a plan in place or you are gonna or this is just on the works well, as council recall we added two additional um, maintenance worker ones to the um, public works budget at the time we did the sustainability reorganization so we finally just got those people on board this last month. Um, so we've got two additional staff that are out there cleaning the city right now. So they, you know, one of the things we do is we stop in the downtown area first thing in the morning, they clean up, try and get some mess cleaned up before people start digging into that. One of the other things we're taking a look at is changing out of some of our trash cans in the downtown area so that people can't reach in, either people or birds can't reach in and pull stuff out and leave it all over the streets. We're looking at something that has a, a closed lid on it so people, it goes in and people can't go in and get it. Um, we're looking at replacing some of those. Um, you know, we're trying to do things possible based on our contact with our staff, um, Republic Services, also services all those trash, trash cans downtown. They empty them on a daily basis. That guy goes out early in the morning and gives us information in terms of the things that he sees and uh, things that we can do to try and reduce that. And so, you know, we've, we've been making efforts in that regard. Um, in addition, again, having four staff being able to cover a city of this size, a very large city, but it's two more people than we had before. So, you know, we're probably going to be able to get through it twice a year now instead of once a year. Um, but that's an effort. And, and, and we continue to respond. We have more people to respond to, to the um, requests for services that come in, um, as well as the stuff that we spot. So, um, you know, we've certainly doubled the amount of resources we have. Uh, but we we still have just four resources to do that. Thank you, uh, Council President McGurvey. Uh, thank you. That leads actually right into my question on uh, sustainability. Um, so I was uh, I really really like what was put forward here, um, and one of the things I, I keyed in on was uh, the uh, zero waste plan. I would love to hear a little bit more on that, particularly 
Um, as you mentioned, the, the uh, trash containers downtown, and I would probably, again, another question for Parks, add on that um, I know our current solid waste contract, uh, contract does not include uh, compost and recycling at those locations. Is that something that this plan will be looking at for the future, for our future contract? Yeah, I think our zero waste plan is really going to take a look at how the thing about a zero waste plan is it's kind of an oxymoron because you never can get to zero waste. You know, we can certainly get it down as low as possible. But we want to try and get our diversion to 95 percent. That'd be great um, because you're always going to have some disposal just based on the environment we live in. But, you know, zero waste plan really start to look at, you know, we've done the big things, which is we've got a composting problem program in our residential sector. We've got it in, um, recycling in our residential sector. But where we need to expand is in our multifamily sector and our commercial sector. And composting, especially food waste composting for restaurants, start to really, really ramp up that area, area to do that, get to, to include that, to divert that material from the disposal stream or the waste stream. Um, I think the recycling programs in public locations and public facilities, um, having the containers is one thing, being able to service those containers and collect them, collect them up is certainly something else. But those are things that will all come out as we complete the zero waste plan because it'll take a look at the whole sector of the waste stream, who the generators are and where, you know, we'll again do it strategically where we go back in and take a look at where we can get the biggest bang for the bucks. What programs can we implement that will reduce the most amount of waste? You know, multifamily and, and commercial sector, we're going to have the constraints of space because um, a lot of these apartments were built at an older time when they only had one trash contain. And so we've got to figure out a way to make sure we can add those containers and make it effective for folks that, that move in and out there on a regular basis to understand how those systems work. So there's some challenges to them, but certainly I think we've, we've got the folks who have the uh, um, ingenuity and the uh, incentive and um, certainly the uh, desire to make those things work. Thank you. Yes, Councilmember O'Halley. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not seeing it here, but you mentioned something about an ESCO project. Yes. That was covered under the uh, um, facilities. So um, I would love to hear more about that. Uh, it uh, not necessarily now, but it sounds like that's an internal focus on um, um, increasing energy efficiency in our existing buildings yep. for our business plan. Um, and any any details uh, that you can bring forward on that work that's been done or planned um, at, a, at a future time, whether it's a committee of the whole or a utility committee meeting or whatever's appropriate. I, I would definitely love to see what you're working on. Roger, it's Jeff Manishi and his folks and facilities have done and I've gotten a number of Department of Commerce grants to really implement these changes. Um, things like variable speed motors and LED lights and things like that. And Jeff will we'll certainly make sure we come back to the, the council and provide that information at a later date. Thank you. All right, Council Member Rivera, I think we're gonna wrap up with you. And I just wanna say um, thank you, Martin, for a great presentation. My colleagues have been very thorough, so I just wanna emphasize that I appreciate what they brought up in regards to sidewalks in the Benson area. I think that should be a very high priority once we get there. Bike lanes becoming more non-motorized reliant or more non-motorized or motor less motorized and more non-motorized reliant as a city. Um, and also I really wanna thank Councilmember Holleran because the Rolling Hills Reservoir is very visible. And I think, you know, Benson would love the little beautification in that area as well. So so thank you again for an incredible presentation and I really thoroughly look forward to the clean economy strategy update. All right, I'm gonna let uh, Councilman Perez and send us out. I'm wrapping this up, but um, just um, I, I'm looking at the president of the council, maybe during the uh, during the review and, 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 and conversation about the, the budget in general, we can uh, put a formal request for consideration for uh, more budget for the beautification of some of those reservoirs that are in the city, since there is an interest from the full council to see that that, that becomes a possible priority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. All right, next Thank up. very much. Thank you, Martin. We have, we have uh, Community and Economic Development, Vanessa. Good evening, Council President and members of the Council. Uh, let me switch the slide here. All right, there you go. So um, 
I'm here representing Chip Vincent, the Administrator for Community and Economic Development. Vanessa Dolby, I'm the Planning Director, so hopefully I can touch on all the important items here for you this evening. But let me start by saying CED's budget is, over the next two-year cycle, approximately $14.5 million per annual basis. On the previous slide, you could see the pages in which those were addressed in the budget book. And I'm going to go through a few items here, starting at the top. So first, I want to start by talking about how CED plays a leadership role in terms of fulfilling the business plan and the objectives in the business plan. If you look at the business plan, almost all five of those mission statements are um, fulfilled by CED. And then that's further advanced and, and send down our staff using this mission statement here identified. I won't read it all for you. So CED's leadership team, many of which are here tonight, um, does ensure that the coordination and collaboration amongst the four divisions, our economic development division, our planning division, our development engineering division, as well as our development services division, is successful in communication and collaboration and ensures that um, we achieve this important role of advancing our vision, our mission, and our goals of the city together. However, that cannot be accomplished with um, our wonderful staff in CED. I've got a few images here of our staff. We uh, took those previous to this when it was a little smoky out. Um, however, our staff is dedicated to meeting the needs of the Renton community, the business community, as well as the development community in all the work that they do. The majority of CED's budget is to fund the 64 FTEs requested in this next budget. And I'd like to start by thanking the council for the reorganization that was approved earlier this year. That reorg allowed uh, the balancing of resources as well as aligning important resources in CED into the departments that help us meet our goals. So that set us up for success moving into 2023. So today there's only actually one budget request coming your way from CED. Let me get some water here. So looking at accomplishments, there is a lot of accomplishments in CED and end up spending a lot of time talking about them. I just want to do a little high level set of accomplishments. Starting with economic development, I want to start by indicating this team has been fairly small, about two FTEs or three FTEs at a high point in the last budget cycle. So with that, though, I do believe that this, this group accomplished a lot in the last couple of years. First, implementation of portions of the Civic Core Vision and Action Plan, such as the Complete Streets Phase 1 and a portion of the Wayfinding Signage, as well as we're excited that the Main Street designation was approved and will begin on January of 2023 for downtown. The con continuation of the LTAC funding for grants for events and activities, as well as support for Renton's arts institutions, including about $20,000 for local, local nonprofits offering free or reduced programming, as well as almost $190,000 for our local artists and art organizations. In addition, as a part of the reorganization approved previously this year, we were able to align our property and technical services team with our economic development team. So this allows us for the first time to be able to make uh, data-driven decisions as a part of our economic development department. And then last, we began a successful downtown cleanup program. And I know we've been talking a lot about downtown cleanup. So this, this program is focused behind the curb and to the business front. So it's a little bit different than what Public Works is talking about. But as you can see in the graph to the right, this is just the month of September where this program was implemented, a significant number of touch points of cleanup in downtown, the top three being garbage, graffiti, and what we call 300. So moving on to our planning group, our planning team continued to assist our customer services, almost 400 visits in our customer world, whether that be emails or phone calls or virtual centers, as well as processing land use applications. I'm going to highlight the 25 pre-approved ADU meetings that we've held with customers. This is a part of our award-winning PRADU program, if you've heard that before. So coming in and sitting down directly with them and helping them figure out if they can have one of these PRADUs on their property. 
In addition, our long range team advanced 43 docket items through our planning commission and through council, including incentivizing cottage housing development within the city, adoption of the Rainy, Rainier Grady Junction TOD sub area plan, that is a mouthful, and then some multifamily property tax exemption areas. Beyond that, our long range team was very busy getting grant funding. The Department of Commerce was pretty generous this past budget cycle with $100,000 awarded for housing action plan implementation, of which $40,000 will be using in our department for a land use analysis, the remainder of which will go to EHHS. $250,000 awarded for a planned action environmental impact statement for the TOD um, transit oriented development. $100,000 awarded for middle housing and to address racially disparate outcomes in land use. $80,000 for vehicle electric electrification action plan, and another $325,000 for our comprehensive plan update. And then I'd be remiss in not uh, mentioning the technology advancements we've advanced in this last year. I know many other departments talked about how COVID moved things you know, forwards quickly on this front. Same goes for CED. It really put our path on steroids in terms of technology advancements. Two things I'd like to highlight. One, we have a virtual permit center now, so it allows customers to have the same experience they would in person, but virtually. As well, as we, we've pivoted all of our land use and building permits and construction permit applications to being online. And what this has done is if you see in the graph to the bottom right here, between 2019 and 2022, We've reduced the required customer in-person visits in our permit center by approximately 85% across the board. You're still welcome to come in, but you don't have to come in. Development services, we've continued to issue building permits approximately 400 per month over the last two years with a total construction valuation of almost $800 million. And then our inspection team has been busy with 55 inspections per day. Now code compliance, our code compliance team has processed on average 500 code cases on an annual basis. So that's a thousand code cases over the last budget cycle total. And they've, um, most of these code cases have come in VC, C click fix or rent and response. And it's interesting, we've seen a significant uptick in our code case uh, reporting within CED. And I, I would like to wager a guess that this is related to two things, one, many people stayed home because of the pandemic and they were able to spend more time in their own community, walking down their own streets and seeing some of the challenges and issues in their neighborhood that maybe they didn't see before. And two is the fact that the ease of rent and see click fix allows them to report that to the city easily. Some positive outcomes here for code compliance with some good graphics for you. Then looking at development engineering, our development engineering team reviewed and processed permits that added $1.5 million in developer contributed assets to the community. So this is things such as new streets, new water lines, new sewer lines, new stormwater lines, and then land in the way of dedication for frontage improvements. Our inspection team inspected $30 million in completed private and public investments. So that's on private property, as well as these public streets. And then the team also advanced a small cell permit process, which allowed 56 small cell permits to come in in the first year. And this is gonna help uh, expand cell coverage to folks within the city of Renton, whether they live here or they visit. And none of this could be done without the help of our volunteer commission. So I'll just take this time to thank the Arts Commission and the Planning Commission for all their efforts over the last year to help us out. Okay, moving on to what we do. Okay, so in CED, the physical evidence of what we do as a department is realized in the development that you see out in the community and whether that adds value to the community as we review it. So with that said, I want to start with a list of development projects looking into the last budget cycle. So these are just notable projects that were completed and looking at the valuation they added to our community. The number we can add to that if we have to monetize it is $142 million for just these notable projects. As mentioned previously, there was, there's more than that. So quickly go through some highlights here. So new affordable housing for Sunset Oaks and Willowcrest. Some new commercial development in Chick-fil-A and Top Golf. 
new middle housing development with Arlington townhomes and Sapphire townhomes, downtown revitalization with the Penny Lofts, and then Walker, Rent, and Mazda down on East Valley Highway. And then moving forwards, a little bit a little bit removed from completed projects, we have projects that are under review. So these started in this last budget cycle, but they'll carry over to the next budget cycle. So this is, again, just a highlight list of permits that are under review in our building department. Noticing the valuation here, we have $186 million of valuation in this, in this list right here. So a big uptick. So highlight these, Park 5 Apartments, which is a mixed-use project in the Highlands. The Cedar River Apartments, another mixed-use project right here down by the Cedar River. Sunset Gardens, an affordable housing project and the um, off new offices of Renton Housing Authority up in the Highlands. And Forest Terrace, which is a new single-family residential development over on the East Plas Plateau. And then again, our projects that are under construction. So this is the same, same, we started working on this in the last budget cycle. We will continue to work on these projects moving into this future budget cycle. Looking at the valuation of these notable projects, we're up ticking up again to almost $275 million in valuation. So Canopy, which is a 55 single family residential home development by exit seven under construction. Watershed, if we could see out the windows, you could see the crane for watershed. That's affordable housing project right outside our window here. Solera, many of you are familiar with Solera, mixed income and hopefully some homeowner op opportunities up in the Sunset area. And Weatherly Inn, which is a new senior living facility. Family First, which we've talked about this evening already. Um, Home Depot, which is revitalization of the Sam's Club building next door. And the new Renton Elementary School for the Renton School District. Now, looking at the built projects, now this list is what I like to call pipeline projects. So these are projects that are only gonna be in the next budget cycle. We haven't really seen them with some minor exception, really not in the last budget cycle. But what you can see here is this list only includes four projects. We have a valuation here of $710 million. This is a significant investment in the Renton community. But also what's important to note is that, and I think you all can appreciate this, we, we in CED, we work in an environment where the economy plays a really big role in folks' decisions whether they want to develop a land or move forwards with a project. So there are a lot of things that I wish I could put on this list, but we cannot put them on the list here today, unfortunately. So this is a list of four projects that have actually come in for land use applications, so I can put them on the list today. However, what I can tell you is that um, it, based on what we know, we do expect to see some major announcements for some new projects coming forward. It's hopefully the near term that I can share with you but right now I cannot. So given that, what I will share with you are these four projects. One is Southport West, which is 1.25 million square feet of office, an additional 50,000 square feet of retail. This will fill out the Southport office campus if you've seen it down there. And I know there's the recent announcement for uh, Wizards of the Coast down at the site. So hopefully this is the start of a tech hub in the city of Renton. Keep our fingers crossed there. Kennedale Gateway, this is another residential project up at exit seven on the old Panabode site, if you're familiar with that. Logan Six, this is a mixed use project that would be located near the Met Memorial Stadium. And last but certainly not least would be the Unico's Sounders Practice Facility down at the Long Acre site. So as we look through these developments, moving past and moving into the future, and we plan for the next budget cycle, the question that one might be asking themselves is what, why do we want to spend $14.5 million on CED moving forwards? And, and I'll answer that question in one in this way. And that is that in the next 20 years, we plan our growth plan for this community is 145,000 in population, as well as almost 100,000 jobs. So if you think about that, that's half as much as our current population and jobs right now. And that's a radical change in terms of what our community will look like. So investing in CED in terms of the re gives us the ability to invest in resources and staff to ensure that this development that's coming through our community adds value 
and meets those communities' needs. In addition, it gives us the ability to meet our legal obligations underneath the Growth Management Act. All right, with that said, I'll move on to goals. Okay, looking at our goals. So economic development, first and foremost, our goal for economic development is to finish staffing, staffing up this division. Um, we have filled one position since the reorg and I am happy to announce today, we have managed to fill the redevelopment manager position with a familiar face. So if all of you remember John Collum, he will be starting on December. So we are excited to fill that position. And then hopefully in the near term, we will be able to fill the economic development director position as well. So first and foremost, we need to staff up. With that in mind, an assumption of a full team moving forwards, the goals for the division is to, to launch some business outreach and recruitment programs, as well as establish a work plan for the Civic Core Action Plan attract new businesses and new development by promoting Renton as a top location for investment, and then continue our successful downtown cleanup initiative and motivate and ignite a creative economy through arts and culture. Our planning group, we're going to focus on updating the comprehensive plan and meeting the state mandated deadlines of 2024 implementing all those many grants that I listed earlier and working hard on those, as well as continuing to engage the community on large scale development projects. Our permitting group, which is across, across divisions, we're gonna continue to provide excellent customer service to our internal and external customers, exceed our departmental goals on timely review of permits, and then provide high quality development review to reduce impacts to the community. And then code compliance, we're gonna to continue to work to, to exceed the departmental goals for timely resolution of code compliance complaints, um, hire the one vacant position we still have in that department, and then also increase the workforce to allow code compliance to implement a, a program of proactive code compliance, which leads me to our one and only budget request from CED, which is for one, full-time code compliance inspector position. And there's three reasons that CED is requesting this code compliance position. First is just to meet the demand in terms of code compliance co cases that we have coming through the, the department. Second is to help support EHHS in the implementation of the rental registration program. And then third is to move from a reactive to a proactive code compliance department. At this point, we were, the way that we are staffed, we really can only respond to complaints and we can't get out there and drive around the streets and find items. So objectively with a new staff member, we may have that ability. And then lastly, there is changes to the fee schedule. So I just wanted to note those, nothing different than our typical increases per construction cost index and an extension of the ADU fee waivers. And that's all I have. Good questions. All right, any questions from council? Sure. Council Member Alberson. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. That was all very good and comprehensive. I have a, a few questions. I'll ask the first one now. Um, I'm all for the the code compliance, the additional code compliance, being more proactive, uh, and uh, and that sort of thing is is great. I was looking at that though on page three forty nine. 3-49 in the numbers. I was trying to see where that was actually represented in the in the budget numbers. Well, specifically in the FTEs, it's um, uh, I can't see where the additional one was added because uh, uh, you said two, and I guess maybe one has been added this year. But then you're asking for another one. Correct. So, so it's been 20 FTEs the whole time. But maybe I missed something because it sounded like there's an increment of two between, I don't know, last year and what you want. What it, what am I missing as far as where that other one is reflected and are the salaries? Is that reflecting the the hope to get the new one or or what? I was trying to jive those numbers. It wasn't quite working for yeah, me. Yeah, let me provide some clarification. So we do have a position now that we're looking to fill. So it's already in the budget, so it's not a new request. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the first one. Okay. And then there's a request for one new additional okay. code compliance officer. 
and where that's reflected. Maybe Karen can help me on the page. That, 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 that may answer for me. I was just, okay. I was looking kind of something to represent because I'd seen at a new and mid 2002 and early 2003. So there was an incremental thing of two and I was, it just wasn't working for me, but I think you answered it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Vanessa? Council member Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, and uh, piggybacking off Councilmember Alverson's question, um, can you provide a little bit more clarity on what priority, what what will we prioritize in proactive code compliance? And the reason I'm asking is, you know, when I speak to community members or neighbors, there are mixed reviews when it comes to code compliance and their priorities. And so, in that sense, what will they, their proactive priorities be? That's a great question have a proactive plan put together for co-compliance as of right now. Uh, first, once we get staffed up, we'll work on, on addressing the reported complaints and then moving in that direction. So we can have a conversation about what those, those should be, um, but we don't have a plan put together exactly right now. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember O'Halloran. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Vanessa. It, this is just more of a curiosity than anything. Southport West? be Southport South. It should be Southport South. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're I, such a nitpicker. I don't picker. name the project. <laughs> you all try not to say anything. <laughs> so was that a typo or was that a conscious decision not to say South? Conscious decision by the developer. Yeah, that's what I figured. Thank you. It just might sound better, Southport West. Interesting. Any other questions for Vanessa? Councilmember Press. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, and thank you for the clarification about the code compliance new employee, because I don't know if this is about communication or the way we we explain how the department work with the community, because yes, the community has this understanding, and I totally agree with Councilmember uh, Rivera, that, uh, did you see how beautiful I said your name? Rivera. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Actually, I, I had a moment, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that um, that the community expects that the code compliance team goes around neighborhoods every day and check, oh, this is something that we have to fix. This is something that we have to fix. They don't realize that they have to actually take a photo, go to rental, rental response, and complain about that. So if we are going to be more proactive and you are going to plan ahead to be proactive, I just would like to have a better communication with the community how this works. Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. And um, they all, even I have misunderstandings sometimes. I, I do sometimes report certain things and then they tell me, no, it's not here. It's with the police. And then the police tell me, well, it's both of those together. So. We, I think we, it should be a more comprehensive what is the approach of the city because we do receive a lot of complaints. I mean, even if it doesn't go to rent and response, we on the community, I think is one of the things that we, the people complain the most. And I don't like as a council member say, oh, well, just take a photo and send it to rent and response. That, that, that the way it goes. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let other people to ask questions and then I, if you can come back with me. Any other questions? Sure. Go ahead, Councilmember. Someone else has. Uh, yeah, Vanessa, on page um, uh, 3 41, uh, under other services and charges, original budget 2022 was zero, the estimate for 2022, 4.5 million. Uh, I didn't see anywhere what that represented, wondering if you can speak to that. Okay, can you repeat the question one more sure. time? Sure. I'm now um, on page 3.41. Uh, under at the bottom, under other services and charges, um, under 2022, it's zero original budget. Um, but the estimate, I guess, what it's going to end up at 4.595 million. What what is that representing? I couldn't I couldn't find that. It's under on the previous page. It's it's under the administration line. That difference is there. But then again, this is a the administration in the administration division. So the, the zero to 4.9 in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. And I will have to either get back to you on that one. Okay. We will have to respond to you on that one at a later date. Look under the couch cushions or something. Well, see. we got to get into the into the details <laughs> of the number. Okay. Any other questions for Vanessa and CD? Councilmember uh, Perez. 
So I get very, very excited when you say that you have a lot of new projects that you cannot tell us and add right now on the list. I hope that one of those is that you guys find a land for Costco. We have been oh. waiting for that for a while, but we I'm searching hard. Okay. So Economic Development Division in the 2023-2024 goals is attract new business and new developments to rent on to increase employment opportunities, sales, and property taxes revenue and, and continue promoting rent on as a top location for investments. This is awesome. This is an amazing goal. I love it. But it, with the problem that we have right now with Costco, my question is, what is the land av av availability for that goal to be complete in the next 10 years in the next 20 years i don't know it's a, i mean it's a great question because at the end of the day we are constrained by land in the city of renton we have growth and we have land constraints we can still grow and and how we get there is usually consolidating lots together to be able to meet those uses that require more space to develop versus uses that develop in a more vertical manner so once we have our economic development team full we can get down into the details of how are we going to facilitate and help developers find these pieces of property. We are doing that now. We're trying to connect the property owners that might be maybe a large piece, but they still need, let's say, five more acres or 10 more acres to put it together, connect those people together to see if they can make a deal. But um, with a full economic development team, hopefully we can pull together a, a approach on how to do that um on a larger scale I have a following question please. please go ahead believe me i'm so looking forward to that thing to be complete <laughs> uh, we have been waiting for a year yes. or longer than that and that um and in this business a year is a lot and um uh, while i understand and you just mentioned our responsibility with the Grow Management Act. I also believe that we have a strong responsibility in protecting the land that we have available for businesses. Even though we have to keep growing, it's very important to know that where the areas they are designated for middle housing and for housing should be strong for that. And we should not take away the land that we have for businesses because it's not, we cannot provide resources to support these communities that are moving to Renton. So I'm looking forward to see the comprehensive plan to be a very balanced and sustainable document. Thank you. Uh, yep, thank you. We will work on that in the coming budget cycle. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Vaughn, then Councilmember Alberson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your presentation, Vanessa. Um, I wanted to uh, really thank you for the goals you have for 2023-24, particularly for page uh, 343 in terms of arts and culture. Um, and I wanted to ask, in terms of the funding in the past and, and in terms of uh, future funding, because I have been approached by quite a bit of artists and, and folks in, in the community, um, and, and as we see throughout the pandemic, there has been quite a bit of phenomenal art pieces out, and, and it's just beautifying our city. Um, so there, I guess my question to you is, have you, have is there a plan to increase more um, artists into the fold, right, uh, in terms of grants. And then, of course, the amount of uh, designated grants that we have right now, um, I guess there's never enough money. But what, what is something that, uh, you know, that you've heard within the commission? Because I'm hearing things and I would like to know your perspective. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I do have Jessie here as well, if, if she wants to come up and speak, speak to that. Um, so we do not, as you notice, we do not have a budget request to add additional funding to the Arts Commission before you today. Um, and you noted we do, there's always more art that we can add. We could, we could keep spending money on art and we do try hard as the commission to identify a variety of art um, and culture opportunities to fund through the grant program. Um, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but you know, it, if there was endless money, I know we would we would continue to give it out, and we, it does add a lot of value to our community in terms of the arts that's at, added and how it creates a space and place that's unique to Renton versus uh, somebody else, some other city. Of course, go ahead. So, with that, have we heard anything from commissioners and and have staff have heard anything in but terms that's of why increasing I would refer to funding? Jesse on I would that love one. To, yeah. 
Yeah, because um, a moment. I think there is a need, and folks have approached me, so I'll ask. Say that the the commission this year has prioritized grant program. There are now four opportunities to apply for funding in 2023, where it used to just be the twice a year, um, or with a rolling application. So this time, the the first deadline just passed for 2023 funding to allow for earlier projects in the year to take place in March through, or January through March. So it's definitely a priority. We've also received some funding additionally from for culture and the port of seattle specifically for arts programs uh, so that will primarily be going towards the artists and the arts community and organizations operating in the city thank you jesse council member alberson and council member o'halloran last one for me i promise <laughs> um page 3.44 this is another one, one of these instances i don't necessarily expect to have an answer if you want to look at this but um the, the salary numbers and the FTE numbers, and especially the increase of six FTEs, didn't, didn't seem to mesh given uh, even the 2022 original budget. The estimate came in lower, but the FTEs were higher. And then, then in 2023, should those, you know, what you're proposing, if that's been approved, that, 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 that progression of numbers doesn't seem to match. And I'm trying to figure out why not? I'll take a stab at this and see, okay. if, see if Carrie wants to add to it. Okay. So um, as a result of the reorg, mm -hmm. more positions moved into economic development, but as I mentioned, a number of them have been vacant. And so we're seeing some less expenditures than we would have normally expected if we were paying those salaries to those FTEs. Does that address the question? Do you want to add some more? Yeah. Well, typically we budget for actual positions. So if they're filled or not, you would see budget. I, I expect that some of this is just based on the reorganization that was done earlier this year, but I would want to make sure that we're tracking those positions in the right out in the right division within CED to be able to answer your question fully. Okay. So we'll get back to you. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just getting back to funding for arts and all of the development that we're anticipating, do we still have a 1% for arts requirement? The 1% for arts requirement applies to capital improvement projects and private development projects are, are not required to provide that 1% for arts. Um, however, we do have some opportunities in our code through planned urban development, uh, land use entitlement options, or others where we can get art if the developer is, you know, proposing that in exchange for maybe something else. Um, however, the 1% for arts does not apply to the private developers. Is that up to us? Was that our decision? Fortunately, that's, that is not, I have Shane in here, he might be able to address that, but but we can't require public art as a part of a development pro project from a legal perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Vanessa? All right, thank you, Vanessa. Thank Thanks, you. Vanessa. Thank you. All right, I'm sure you all have saved all your hard questions for the next department that's coming up. <laughs> uh, we have our city attorney. <laughs> Good evening. I'll jump right in here. Um, I am Shane Maloney. I am representing the city attorney department for our budget presentation. And just a, a background of our department, we are split into a civil division and a prosecution division. Our civil division, um, I, I think, supports all elements of the um, business plan because we, although we don't own our own projects, many of the projects that you hear about tonight and last week, um, those aren't our projects, but we do advise behind the scenes on them, whether it's assisting interpreting the laws, assisting in complying with laws, assisting in drafting legislation, assisting with contracts. Um, we're really behind the scenes and supporting the whole city in getting to its goals. Um, we do so through our representation of the council, through boards and commissions, the administration, um, all departments. And then on the prosecution side, we prosecute misdemeanors. Um, and it, that is all crimes that come with a sentence of less than one year, essentially, is what a misdemeanor is. So that's a changing 
dynamic of what that means. There's been changes in law that have changed felony crimes to misdemeanor crimes. Um, and yeah, it, the law is always evolving there. We do focus on equity in everything, whether it's in our civil advising, but also uh, it, particularly in our prosecution. We look at equity from a perspective of a victim who lacks or, or has different background and circumstances that may put them in a, bit, a different position when they're dealing with the, the criminal justice system, not understanding how it works, not having the same, same resources that others might have. And I think we, we put in extra work to help those victims through the system um, and uh, to, to help obtain justice. And then we also look at equity in terms of uh, offenders and defendants and understanding that they also come with different backgrounds. Um, and you know whether it's through community court or whether it's outside of the community court setting, um, we really look at those factors when we're deciding how to best create a, a, a equitable outcome for everyone involved in, in the unfortunate situation whenever you get involved in a, in a criminal um, uh, charge. So with that, I'll just jump into the uh, department proposed budget. Uh, we are requesting a 3.2 roughly million dollar budget in 2023 and a 3.3 in 2024. Um, one thing I, I think Councilmember Albertson has has mentioned in a few different ones of these, there's a there's a difference between the adopted and the estimate when you look at 2022. And I had the same questions, like why is there such a big jump here? We did have a reorganization. I think the reorganization makes up about half of that change. That's a very rough number. Um, and then there were also some just allocation changes that the council has approved in past budget amendments. So the city changed the way that it allocates its IT and its facility services. So that changed some numbers here that reflect something. It, it is not actually an estimate that we have exceeded what you adopted in a budget. It's an estimate of what would be on track and according to your budget. I believe we're actually on track for less because of salary savings and things like that. Our, our true likely final number is lower than the number shown there, um, again, because of position openings or some other savings. Um, we only have two uh, proposed budgets. Both of them are relatively small. Um, the first one is uh, a funding for a case management system. We have a case management system right now for our prosecutors. It is dated. It takes a lot of work for IT to work on, and it doesn't allow us to, to run reports or really get a good idea of what our work product is. And we, we need to be able to improve that so we can more fluidly identify what we're working on and, and what our accomplishments are. Um, for our civil, uh, we don't have a, a case management system that we're working within. We're working within Windows environment or it, 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 we're creating our own through spreadsheets and otherwise. And so we're, we're looking to get something in place so that we can be much better organized. Um, our preliminary estimates, we have not gone out for a request for proposals. We've done some initial investigation, working with IT, identifying costs. It looks like most of the costs will likely be in the first year and then maintenance fees in the second year. There are different systems out there that charge less upfront and more ongoing. We don't know exactly what it will be, but this is what we've put into the budget in order to predict what a reasonable projection of what it might cost. Um, and again, we haven't gone out to do anything yet because we need your authority before we start doing that work. Um, and then the other one is a, is just a follow up on the reorganization that was approved, I believe in 2021, when we added a um, lead prosecutor position. At the time we added that position, we did not add money for training and licensing. And the only reason why we didn't add it at that time is because we had budget savings. So we're just, this is just a cleanup that we're putting in now. We don't expect to continue to have the budget savings going forward. Remember in, in the 2000, 2021 timeframe, we weren't going to in-person training. We saved a lot of money that way. So we just didn't ask for an ad at that time. So this is some, and I have an asterisk there next to the statistics. These are some numbers that we put together. Again, we don't have a case management system for the most part. So we've borrowed from uh, different locations and tried to give estimates here. I do hope that if we get a case management system in place that we can provide better statistics, more detailed statistics, um, and, and really be able to answer questions both for ourselves and also for you and kind of monitoring uh, the type of work we do. This is not comprehensive, the different types of work we do. Um, I mean, it's it's not covering legal advice. It's not covering code enforcement calls us up and says, hey, what can we do about this? Or police call, they call us up and say, hey, what do we do in this situation? It's just not gonna be counted here. Um, but some broad categories that we just wanted to give you an idea of things that we cover. 
uh, some of our accomplishments, uh, we, we were able to get through the backlog of criminal trials that was COVID related, um, it, which uh, was a, a very big task considering that the courts were largely the, closed for trials um, for, I, I think it was almost two years that we were going without trials. So we had that backlog and we were able to get through that. Um, and we are, we've moved on to conducting court with remote attendance options. It's kind of hybrid court. We're hybrid working. We're also hybrid um, court. There are certain things that we ask people to come in for court, regardless of whether or not they'd rather not to, but there's many times where it's, it's quite an accommodation to allow people not to go to court. I believe we're still um, allowing juries for jury selection to attend remotely so that if you don't get picked, you don't have to have come in and um, gone through the process in person. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, it, that's one example of what we had been doing in the past, at least. Um, so we, have, we haven't done this ourselves, but with the court and with the public defenders and community providers, we've um, cooperated in the creation of the community court program. Um, we did implement the, re the department reorganization that I mentioned, and, um, and then we've continued to represent and advise the city in a number of uh, challenges. So goals going forward, uh, these are kind of reoccurring. We're always seeking to in increase our training, but particularly for now, we're looking to increase our training, getting back to normal, but also st starting to train our, our non-attorney staff. We've focused on providing mandatory requirements for, for legal training, but as our, as we try to be more efficient with technology and we keep on staying lean. We really need training opportunities for our non-attorney staff too to change the way that we do business and help us work with, for example, the um, records management system type of things, case management systems. Um, we are always focused on providing training to other departments. I think that we're gonna try to start doing that more as we all get back to work in person more often. It becomes easier to provide that type of training and um, continue to assist the city in adapting to changing laws, uh, particularly public safety and criminal justice system laws have been changing quite frequently. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing challenge to help our clients stay up to date on what their legal requirements are for dealing with those issues. Um, and again, continue to use uh, technology to increase tech, uh, to increase our efficiencies and remain flexible because we never know what's going to come next. Uh, emerging challenges, I mentioned community court. It does require, these are kind of the budgetary emergency challenge or emerging, emerging challenges. What do we have on our plate that we might cause us resources issues, right? So as we focus on community court, community court is a much more frequent cadence. We're meeting weekly with defendants instead of closer to monthly, right? So we're, and, and we're spending a lot more time, we're learning about their background, we're sitting down and tr trying to figure out what resources they need. That just, it takes more time if you're going to actually invest in a person to move on and, and, and find the resources that they need so that they can be a more productive, uh, productive citizen, right? So, um, it's fantastic. It takes more time. So as that grows, we're just going to be monitoring you know, how does that affect our, our needs for resources? Um, it, again, unplanned civil workload, as the city grows, our population grows, we add new, add new code enforcement, that's one more person to come to us for legal advice. All of these uh, growing issues of a city, we're just gonna be monitoring that. We operate lean um, and we don't ask for more unless we feel like we really need it. I'm just identifying some things that could, you know, come into future requests. Um, uh, unknown impacts future legal changes and felony char charging standards. Just to give you one example there. Um, it used to be drugs were all felony charges, with the exception of marijuana be before it became largely legalized. Um, those have now been moved to misdemeanors. Um, those are largely not being enforced right now in our in our court because the the police have their hands tied largely from being able to refer those charges um, and. There's legislation that will likely be coming um, in the next legislative session that will deal with it, with those issues. We may be dealing with those issues uh, it, with this body may it may wish to deal with some of those issues yourself. So we don't know how that's going to play out yet, how those types of um, new charges will come down and affect our workloads. Um, 
So again, that's just one example of future changes that may change. I mentioned the felony charging standards. Uh, it, it is a frequent theme, at least over the last at least decade, that the King County Felony Prosecutor's Office changes their standards where we have charges that are that meet the definition of felony under the state law, but they decline those charges and deem them as um, not as not justifying felony charges, and they refer them back to the police department to file as, as misdemeanors. Those actually, both because the cases tend to be more complex and also um, because it makes it complex to charge a crime uh, that doesn't exist as a misdemeanor because it's a felony, it creates difficulties. So how that changes over time, we just keep an eye on that. Um, and then just last, because we're adding a, a case management system, implementing new efficiencies always requires more resources. I mean, the reason why you don't get more efficient oftentimes and do things is because it takes more time up front to, to put the work in to design the program to figure out what you need to do. And when you're really busy, it's hard to do. So that's just a challenge that we know we'll be facing. Questions? All right. Any questions from council for the city attorney? I guess you got off easy, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we are going to move on to HR. Council McCur President McGurvin, McCurvin being remote kind of threw me off a little bit. I'm going to stick with my script. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Council President McGurvin and Council. My name is Ellen Bradley Mock. It is my privilege to serve as the Administrator for Human Resources and Risk Management Department. With me this evening is Kim Gilman, who serves as the HR Labor Manager and as my deputy during my absences. Tonight, I will be presenting our budget proposal for the 2023-2024 biennium. I want to begin by thanking the exceptional team of HR professionals I work beside every day, my colleagues and leadership team, many of whom are still here, I hope, for their partnership in every aspect of our work and to you, Council, for your continued support. This slide represents our requests. I will cover the first two bullets with more detail in a few slides. The third and fourth bullet offer an explanation for the jump in our total budget from year 2022 to 2023. The mission of Human Resources and Risk Management is to partner with the leadership team, employees, and union representatives, as well as community members to create a culturally positive, inclusive, and effective workplace. As you know, there are three divisions within HR, and all of the comments that have been made before me tonight and some that were made last Monday about reorganizations and new positions and things, those are but an example of the kind of work that we do behind the scenes. Here we have highlighted just three accomplishments per division as demonstration of how we've spent the funds you have allocated to do our work. The Employee Relations Division, which is headed up by Kim, reached agreement for three successor union contracts in the past two years. We implemented phase one of the non-represented compensation salary study. You'll be hearing about phase two in a little bit. And like nearly every public employer, we have experienced more resignations than usual over these last two years of COVID. We have filled over 120 vacancies since the beginning of this year while continuing to keep our eye on equitable hiring strategies. In our benefits division, who but their primary goal is to support and onboard all of these new employees that we're hiring, works with employees around accommodation issues related to COVID and working in a hybrid workforce. They've implemented a VEBA plan program or a benefit for our AFSME union members as well as the Guild. They participated in an audit of our self-funded insurance with regard to administrative procedures. This audit is a requirement of self-funded plans and any corrections that were necessary, they're working to continue to implement. Risk management always has a keen eye on both employee and the public safety 
and are constantly looking for ways to implement measures for improvement. Engaged in, they engage in a competitive process, process for excess loss coverage in partnership with our Broker Alliant, uh, an initiative that you approved not too long ago. We managed to achieve single digit rate increase, which was pretty phenomenal for us. With your support, we added one limited term employee, the health and safety coordinator with the use of ARPA funds to manage and respond to COVID. And she's doing an amazing job. Through the subrogation process, we've sought monetary recovery for damage to city property. Although our goal is always to achieve as much money as we can to put back in the coffers, we tend to hover around a 30% collection rate, which is not too bad. So we continue our efforts in that way. As we look ahead to 2023 and 2024, we have the following goals in mind. We will, con we will continue to find more efficient HR processes for employees using the NeoGov software for onboarding and offboarding, as an example. In partnership with Equity, Housing, and Human Services, we will continue to implement strategies outlined in our HR diversity, equity, and in inclusion tactical plan with regard to employee recruitment and retention. We'll negotiate successor bargaining agreements, improve procedures for worker compensation claims, continue to provide training to leadership regarding protected leaves, as well as other forms of training, Continue to audit the self-funded insurance plan as required. Work to update employee safety policies and procedures. Continue to maintain appropriate and cost-effective excess insurance in order to protect our assets. And when our assets are damaged, we will utilize the subject subrogation process to hold third parties accountable for those losses. We will accomplish these goals through existing funds, as well as the following new program requests. Request number one, due to higher costs of existing services, we request just over $15,000 to support, to support recruitment services in the areas of medical exams, civil service recruitments, advertising, and membership in professional organizations. Request number two, Complete the uploading of paper personnel and benefits documents into the LaserFish system by allocating $9,600 to hire a temporary employee to help offset this workload. Request number three, fund a new general ledger account in the amount of $10,000 to handle approved requests for ADA accommodations, which have historically been paid for by the employee's department. This will be a very neutral place for that kind of accommodation expense to reside. We have anticipated requests from implementation of phase two of the non-represented compensation study and the annual reclassification process. We were unable to complete these processes in time to meet the deadline for printing the proposed budget document, but want you to be aware of these anticipated future costs. For our non-represented compensation study, phase two, we'll be impacting 22 positions for an estimated cost of $210,000. In our reclassification process, we're looking at impacting two positions with an estimated cost of $20,000. I look forward to bringing these to council in the middle of December. This is the composition of the Human Resources and Risk Management Department. You'll see that there are 14 and a half positions listed, in, which include the supported employee who currently reports to the, to the city clerk's office, and 13 staff in Human Resources and Risk Management. We believe that at this moment, we are adequately staffed to handle the current workload. But of course, that remains to be seen as times change and laws and regulations change. The 0.5 position that's listed is a new request that would be filled as a limited term position to assist in the anticipated replacement of Eden, which are, is our HRIS system. Carrie Roller will be providing additional details during her presentation, which is next. These are the positions and here are the people. We are enjoying a lunch together at a local restaurant. You probably know the one I'm speaking of. 
we had a good time that day. And that concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer your questions. Any questions from council? Councilmember Perez. I actually don't have any questions, but I, well, I have a couple of comments. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you for great presentation. And thank you for all the work that your department does. I still have very fresh in my memory the beginning of 2020. And, and that day that the mayor and I, we were trying to figure it out COVID. And, uh, and I say I, because I was the president at the time. And you were ready. You were ready to send everybody to work from home day one and how incredible your whole department has been in bringing back employees and facilitate for this. It's, those are the things that people don't realize how hard your department and smoothly work to do this, but you were 24 seven available to make sure that every single employee felt comfortable in such a terrible and unknown situation. And for that, I highly appreciate your job and the job of your full department because just few people were able to transition all these people that were here to be safe in a short period of time. Thank you. Which bring me to my biggest support to one of your requests, which is the support of recruitment and rotation. Um, I think you are right. We have lost a lot of people and now recruiting those new people has been becoming very challenging. And it's not just about recruiting anybody, it's recruiting people, high quality people mm -hmm. that yes. will provide the services at this level. Um, every single time that someone is gonna retire, I start freaking out and I say, now how long is gonna take until we get someone, right? And it's very challenging, very challenging these days. Um, do you think that your department will eventually or the whole city will be able to catch up with that to catch up with you know the not have to wait a year to fill a position because i know that this is not happening here it's happening in every single city mm -hmm. and it, this is this cycle i don't know if it, it's going to end sooner or later but what are your what are your thoughts about that well, my thoughts are, and Kim, if you have thoughts, you're welcome to join in, is that we have already begun to see a turnaround in terms of the number of applications that we're getting in terms of uh, the different positions that we're, we're advertising for. And I see that as a positive sign. When I listen to the news and read reports, I see from our Society of Human Resource Management is where I get a lot of my information, showing that the job market is improving, job claims are down, although I did just read something that they might be on a little bit of an uptick. But, but either way, we are seeing a turnaround in terms of the numbers that are applying for us. We are seeing higher quality applicants coming through. It takes a partnership between what the hiring manager sees as their vision for this position that they're hiring for, the job duties that need to be met, and then the qualified candidate. And when those three things marry, we absolutely can find good candidates for them for those positions my staff is a little short-handed right now as we had have do have two vacancies but we have new hires coming on board next month that we will be we will be training and bringing up to speed we're also coming into a time of the year when it's harder to recruit as we approach the holidays it is notoriously a hard time to recruit but January is usually gangbusters. So with these new positions should, that have been requested through other presentations, should you approve those requests? We have no doubt that we'll be able to meet the challenge of filling those positions. Thank you, good to hear. Yes. Very good news, thank you. Any other questions for HR and Ellen? All right, thank you, Ellen. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right. Finance, Carrie. Right. Right. So we started it off, and we'll we'll end with us as well. So um, just wanted to start with a picture of our team. We've had a lot of transition in our finance department over the last three or four years, and it's nice to um, start to get settled in and get some of the key positions filled. So, um, oops. Um, this is an overview of our budget. 
We are asking for, um, we have one request of a limited term finance analyst position to onboard our new accounting software that we're looking to implement. And I'm gonna speak to that a little bit later in the presentation. So our goals that we set out for ourselves last biennium, just to highlight a couple of them. Um, the first is that our finance team was again nationally recognized by the Government Finance Officers Association for um, presentation and preparation of our budget as well as our financial statement. And so this is something that the city has accomplished over the last 30 plus years every year. We take great pride in this. Not all cities do this. It, it takes extra work and application process. And so um, just wanted to, to mention that this is such a great accomplishment. Um, the other thing is, is that we completed our vendor fall, our vendor fair last fall. Um, this was something that we'd been talking about doing quite a bit over the last several years, where we wanted to um, ask some some small businesses in our community to come learn about contracting with the city, how to go through the bidding process and just get to know the city better. We were able to do this remotely. Unfortunately, we wanted to do it in person, but we did it remotely. We had over 20 participants. We were able to break up into small groups and they could meet with different um, members of the city. We had different departments represented where they could ask questions about what types of services we contract for at the city. So it was a great success. And I forgot to introduce Kristen Trevellis to my right. When I started, I just jumped in. Um, Kristen is in charge of the group that pulls this whole budget together. So her team and the work that they've all done is what you're seeing today. So I apologize for that. So our goals for the next um, biennium is to bring on our new accounting system. I know that we've talked a lot about it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing and it's a big accomplishment that we're gonna need to really focus on the next couple of years. Along with that, we're really gonna be looking at our banking contract and how we work with our um, bank and the services that we provide. As we're bringing on a new accounting system, we thought it was a good time to also be looking at our banking services. The other thing that we're gonna be looking at is how to allocate our overhead costs and our internal service funds. It's something that we haven't done in quite a while. So just looking at that methodology on how we allocate those costs to the other departments. So this is our budget and finance. It's a very bland budget. You know, we're a, a support department. So most of our budget is consists of staff time um, and interfund payments. So over 70% is just from staffing to support the city. The other large pie of that is um, other services, which is our banking and our bank merchant fee. So credit card processing fees is, is a large amount of that. Our state auditor, um, they do an annual audit every year that um, costs are in there, as well as we have some outside support from legal support for any b &O tax audit challenges that come up. So just to highlight our main request this year is um, to bring on the new um, enterprise system for the accounting system. It's over 20 years old and lots has changed in the software industry in the last 20 years. And it's amazing that our, um, our system's still limping along. So we're excited to get started on this. This is something we've talked about quite a bit over the last several years. And the, the vendor has come forward and said that they will not support the system anymore. So it's, it's something that we're having to, to be faced with now to um, bring that on. So this system supports the entire city. Um, we're from payroll processing to issuing our checks. Um, a lot of our other systems feeds into the system as well. And we, we also handle this to do our full budget preparation. So in addition to software costs, we're looking to add staffing um, support to do some research analysis, implementation and process improvement along the way as we implement this. And so along with finance, HR and IT, we would, um, we would like to each have a limited term position to help bring this on over the next several years. We've really reached out to a lot of other cities who have also gone through a transition of this magnitude. And um, they've all mentioned that having that support staff that's dedicated to this implementation over a multi-year period is really needed to map processes and make sure we just get the right thing in place. We're also having to transition data from the old system and making sure that all of that is um, transitioning properly. So for the software and consultant costs, we have um, budgeted funds from IT savings from 2021, as well as we set aside some savings that we found this year um, in the year end budget adjustment for some software costs. So this proposed budget is just asking for those um, limited term positions. And then that is it for us. I open it up to questions. Any questions from the council? 
Councilmember Press. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Not just for the budget presentation, for but for the full budget. I mean, it was great effort. It was great document put together. And uh, and full disclosure, in my one on one with with Kerry, I have a conversation about. Uh, I have been reviewing different budgets from other cities and counties and even the RFA and I told her this is the way that we always do it. Do it. This is the old way. Is there a better way to do it? And say, of course, absolutely, there is a better way to do it. And that's the reason why we are uh, updating the accounting system. And you know, Kerry, that was the right answer. I love it because uh, I'm fully supporting, support, support, supporting this. I don't know why it has taken us so long to to do this, to be honest with you. Got to be a reasoning behind this. I guess it's money. But um, but I know that every single transition is going to be a challenge, especially, especially when it's softwares. Um, I'm very afraid all the time because I'm not that technical savvy. So I'm always like, oh my God, this new thing, even with my phone, you know, I'm like, <laughs> how am I going to use this? But I know that the, that I'm looking forward for this. I'm looking forward for uh, for a new system because this is the this is this is very important. This is the taxpayers' money that we have the the obligation to make sure that we use it in a very very uh, a, a smart way. So having better be, better tools to do that, I cannot support more of this. So thank you, Kerry, for bringing it forward. I think I know this is your first budget year and I want to thank you and congratulate you because I think you were very well with everybody in the city with all the head departments to put together this document so thank you very much the, the timing was perfect and 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 I know that your department works very hard with everybody to be able to present this to the council so I just thank you Councilmember O'Hallon yes thank you very much I echo Councilmember Perez's comments. Um, having spent the last seven and a half years of my professional career doing sim system implementation and ERP conversions, um, I appreciate the fact that you are bringing in additional help to help shepherd the project through, but I'm wondering if you have considered the soft costs of the fact that you're only subject matter experts are your existing employees and the amount of time that they are going to have to spend mapping out their own processes, every keystroke, every decision tree, because the consultant is, or the part-time person is not going to know those things. And I have found that, that those soft dollars not only uh, cost a lot in terms of overtime, but stress because I still have my day job to do while I'm supporting the implementation. So I'm wondering if you've given some thought to that. We have, and it is a concern that we have. Um, in the last year, just because we've had so much transition in finance, we have really focused on um, documenting our process just for um, be able to transition to another person um, and do some cross training. And so we have a nice library of statement and procedures that we've already started that we hope that we can really lean on. But that is a concern overall, just um, you know how how we're going to be able to get through it all um, because we will have to lean on our current staff. Thank you. Any other questions for Carrie? All right. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Carrie. Thank you. Um, I just a comment. I this is I've been on this in this body for eleven years now. I think this is the fastest that we've finished these hearings, um, and so I think that's the testament to my colleagues, but also to the staff that presented to us. So thank you all uh, for your presentations. Uh, and with that, committee whole is adjourned. <laughs>